All right, we already have a great crowd. Um, so good morning, my name is Mary Leonard. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Pediatric Grand Rounds. Um, as you can see, we're very fortunate that Dean Pizzo is gonna join us. Um, but looking ahead, wanna make sure everybody sees that we have some very notable uh, Grand Rounds coming up. Next week is the Susan Orr Endowed Lecture Series, Children's Lives on the Border, Stories from the <laughs> Front Lines, and then the following week is Controversies in Abusive Head Trauma. Please make sure to get your CME credit. The text information is on the left. It's a unique text code every week. And we'll make sure to put that in the chat for your convenience. Next slide, please. And then just one more time to make sure everybody had a chance to get it. And all right, so next week is a very exciting week in many ways. Um, so the maternal and the Stanford Maternal and Child Health Research Institute annual symposium is on Friday. This is the third year we've done this. It's been a really great opportunity to showcase all the incredible work in maternal and child health that's happening across the Stanford campus and a very distinguished lineup of speakers who've been funded through MCHRI, including trainees and senior faculty. And each year we bring out a keynote speaker. This year's keynote speaker is David Williams, who's the senior vice president and the chief scientific officer at Boston Children's Hospital. Also wanna make a note that we have a special session on diversity, health equity, and social justice and a session on COVID-19. So very timely uh, seminar. Next slide, please. And I'm sure you all know we, about this extraordinary series that Alan Schroeder, Rajni Matthews, and many others have put together on COVID-19 children. Every week, it's been an incredible lineup of speakers on every, uh, speaking on every aspect of COVID-19. And next Thursday is Bonnie. So information can be found on, our, on the pediatrics uh, education website. So be sure to join us next Thursday. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to Bonnie to do our introduction. Thank you, Mary. Um, I'm sorry I'm having technical issues this morning, which I need to fix. I can't um, actually open my uh, video, but I'm here uh, in the background. Uh, and one, it's extremely uh, 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 fortunate for all of us to be able to hear from uh, Dr. Phil Pizzo today. And it's also my honor to introduce him. I think most of you know Dr. Pizzo, but let me just go very, very briefly over his uh, background and accomplishments. So Dr. Pizzo is currently the founding director of the Distinguished Careers Institute at Stanford University. Um, and he is the former uh, Dean of the Stanford School of Medicine. He was the Dean here um, uh, from uh, 2001 to 2012. Um, he led a number of amazing um, uh, initiatives during that time, not the least of which was basically the creation of the statewide um, uh, uh, a, uh, Regen Center for uh, Regenerative Medicine, which uh, uh, was led by statewide funding and actually was established here at Stanford and continues to this day. Um, he was, uh, before that, uh, coming to Stanford, he actually started his career at the, the NIH as the head of the pediatric branch and as the director of science for the National Cancer Institute and led um, all of the pediatric oncology and infectious disease complications uh, trials for the National Cancer Institute at the National Institutes of Health. Um, he uh, had a long and distinguished career there, including uh, one of actually the first uh, uh, efficacy trial of uh, in intravenous uh, uh, AZT. We're talking about an interesting time when he actually had to infuse AZT to demonstrate effectiveness of AZT in the reduction of symptoms in young children with HIV. And then he went on to uh, be the, uh, the chair of pediatrics at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, and then following that, he uh, was our dean here for 12 years. Uh, Dr. Pizzo's area of interest, he's double boarded in uh, pediatric hematology oncology as well as infectious diseases, has been actively involved in both divisions here at Stanford as well as around the world. He has numerous uh, awards and, uh, and recognitions, including a member of the National Academy of Medicine and others, has over 600 publications in the field of uh, pediatric hematology oncology, as well as infectious disease complications in children um, and with cancer, as well as with HIV. And um, uh, he continues to be a strong and uh, mentor and advocate for pediatrics 
at the state and regional, national and international level. And uh, I can't think of a better person to come and talk to us today about the, um, this uh, topic around a century that is being bookended by pandemics. And so with that, I'd love to uh, introduce Dr. Pizzo. Well, thank you so much, Bonnie, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you, Mary, for your leadership. And Bonnie, also for the extraordinary job that you have been doing um, during COVID in uh, not only leading Stanford, but being a voice of reason for the nation. I also want to thank our Pediatric Infectious Disease Division for all the work they're doing. And of course, all of the providers, physicians, nurses, and others here at Stanford and elsewhere who are on the front lines of this incredible pandemic. Um, I'll begin by saying that I don't have any financial conflicts related to this discussion. I do want to give you a caveat as I'm getting started, and that is this presentation will actually be more of an essay than a traditional data-driven grand rounds. My goal is really to weave together um, the threads of science and medicine and how they've been perceived and impacted by politics and public health over the past century. Infectious diseases and pandemics occur in a social context that occurs how we think and react to them, part of the biopsychosocial triad um, that's so relevant. So in this presentation, um, there are gonna be relatively few slides. Um, so uh, you'll be really listening to me in a conversation. Um, and I'm gonna offer a few comments about microbes and pandemics. And then I'm gonna talk about um, the first of the bookends, the 1918 influenza pandemic. And from that, by weaving a few threads, I'll then come to uh, uh, the HIV era uh, that really began in 1981, 40 years ago. And then from that leap forward um, to what we're dealing with today, uh, the second bookend and what the pandemic reveals about forgotten lessons and political and social forces. Um, there have been so many wonderful talks, Bonnie, uh, particularly giving a number of them about the science behind uh, the current pandemic that I'm not really gonna be focusing on that deeply today, but um, you'll get a sense of where we're going as I, I proceed. So first, just by way of um, general context and remembering the importance of microorganisms, they of course antedate animal species and there are tons of interactions between humans and animal species and viruses and microbes uh, along our evolution. There are actually uh, over a trillion microbes on earth in all different settings, the hottest to the coldest. And of course, the ones we're focusing on now relate to the zoonoses, um, which are the infections that uh, really have the potential as we're witnessing today for unpredictable and explosive um, growth. We know that when you look at um, uh, these infections collectively, that they constitute a really important part of global mortality. In fact, of the 56 million people who died in 2018, approximately a quarter of them were due to infections, the top five being respiratory diseases, diarrheal diseases, HIV, AIDS, TB, and malaria. The rest are, of course, due to non-communicable diseases and increasingly um, in this country to diseases of despair. When a pandemic occurs, like we're witnessing today, uh, one looks at excess mortality as a way of gauging impact. And the CDC just published on October 23rd, um, just a week ago, a report from January through early October um, that witnessed the fact that we've had about 299,000 more deaths during this period um, than we did in the prior years, and that two out of three of those deaths were COVID related. And importantly, and a theme that I'll come back to during this presentation, um, they were much more common in uh, minority communities. So whereas 11.9% of the excess deaths occurred in white people, 34.6% um, occurred in blacks, and 536 in Latinx. So this is a disease that continues to affect our ethnic and underserved um, communities. A little bit of a comment on uh, where we are with regard to epidemics and pandemics. Of course, epidemics occur periodically in communities um, where there has been a, 
lack of um, immunity. And there have been some incredible historical events that you'll know occurred even in this country um, that eliminated 56 million Native Americans in the 16th and 17th century when infectious organisms like smallpox and measles and the plague were introduced into the New World. And those are wonderfully demonstrated in Jared Diamond's classic book called Guns, Germs, and Steel, which if you haven't read, is certainly worth looking at. Pandemics really represent a different escalation um, because of the fact that they are transmitted beyond geographic boundaries um, to wide communities. And the major uh, reason for that is when there's a conversion um, of a zoonosis from animal to human to, uh, to human to human transmission, which is of course what we're witnessing today with SARS-CoV-2. And the most efficient way of transmission, of course, is respiratory and air droplets and aerosolization play a big role. But there are many other um, routes, as you know, for different organisms ranging from fecal oral with uh, to sexual transmission, um, to blood secretions, um, and that these are influenced by a lot of the social changes uh, which are occurring, particularly the increase in urbanization, concentration of people, and needless to say, moving beyond waterfowl and avian species to plains and routes of communication that really allow us um, to bring these infections um, forward in such a rapid way. So I'm gonna just quickly share uh, my screen here now and show you. So this is just to put into perspective uh, a little bit of how mortality has related to these uh, infections. And you can see here that the biggest cause is due to, uh, oops, wrong way. is due to uh, bubonic plague, which is of course a bacterial uh, organism. It's responsible for more than just that. Um, it also was responsible for the plague uh, that occurred in the uh, 1540s, the plague of Justinian. And you can see here um, that the Spanish flu, and I'll comment about this momentarily, uh, contributed about 40 to 50 million deaths. Some say it's actually up to 100 million deaths. And here, way back uh, at the beginning, uh, the end of August, is where we are with COVID. Uh, but that was the end of August and it's already leapt, of course, to now in between the Asian flu and uh, some of the events of the 17th century. And one can envision um, that that is going to increase uh, even more so as we uh, go forward. So as we think about um, where we are with the uh, plague and I shouldn't have shut off that shared screen so quickly, but here we go. Uh, I want to come to where we begin in our current story. So on March 4th, 2018, a private and a cook at Camp Funston in Haskell County, Kansas, became ill. And within three weeks, there were, were 1,100 soldiers admitted to the hospitals and thousands more were ill. And this is kind of the setting, if you see here at Camp Funston, that people were living in. Beds side by side, um, close connection. Um, between individuals, um, really allowing transmission to occur silently, which is one of the reasons why uh, influenza in 1918 spread so quickly and silently uh, throughout the world, uh, where travel and communications, of course, were quite different um, than they are today. This is a uh, painting uh, by John Singer Sargent um, that uh, occurred in um, uh, Europe during the war. The first European cases were in Brest in April of 2018, and then it spread rapidly, of course, to uh, crowded military barracks. And actually, uh, their approach to identifying individuals who were infected was simply to put that kind of reddish um, blanket on uh, the individuals as compared to the more brownish on those who were thought um, to be uninfected. Um, so some stories continue from uh, days of past to where we are today. Um, uh, there are some other connections. There was a uh, infection in a ship off of Greenland where literally 10% of the individuals died uh, of infection. And this gave uh, evidence of the progressive lethality of this disease. And then the impact was further evidenced with the US Leviathan in the summer of 2018, in which Prime Minister David Lloyd George nearly died, uh, as did Mahatma Gandhi. In some ways, this is a little bit of the equivalent of the Diamond Prince Princess uh, episode that's occurred uh, with COVID um, in our current era. 
By June of um, 2018, the infection had spread all through Western Europe since so many troops were being infected that some, including some military leaders like um, Ludendorff, actually contemplated putting off battle. Um, but tragically, the focus was on war and they just continued anyway with all of the consequences thereof. Now, as you know, we tend to think of the 1918 uh, pandemic as the Spanish flu pandemic. And why is that? Well, there are actually relatively fewer cases in Spain in 1918, but it was a neutral country. Um, and there was a lot of reporting uh, of events coming out of Spain. And uh, at that time, um, uh, when uh, the king, Alfonso the, the 13th, became seriously ill, uh, the press began labeling this as the Spanish flu, because they were covering um, this story. But actually, the name had nothing to do with the place of origin. I've already shown you that which was in Kansas, uh, not Spain, but it's persisted since. And that actually speaks to some of the challenges that we face today and how things are labeled um, and attributed to different causations. So as you may well know, the Black Death was often identified as a punishment from God and it bred pogroms and a lot of anti-Semitism. And as we'll talk about, there were lots of perceptions about AIDS as a gay disease with lots of discrimination, not only against the gay community, but also against the Haitian community. And of course, syphilis um, has been attributed to every nation uh, where the boats came from as compared to the one that's experiencing uh, the actual onset of the disease. So back to our social setting with regard to 1918 and the pandemic. Um, this was right in the middle of um, World War I, which began, of course, in 1914. Uh, it was a progressive era where uh, Roosevelt had championed uh, the progressive period of populism, but it was also a time which has similarly to what we're experiencing today of a lot of isolationism, racism, uh, and anti-immigration. In fact, Wilson, who became president in 1912 when he defeated Howard Taft and Roosevelt, um, uh, had, had been actually the president of Princeton before that, and the governor of, of New York uh, before he became the 28th um, president. And while there are a lot of differences, there are some similarities to the current 45th president. Wilson, as it turns out, was a lifelong racist and segregationist to the point that on June 26th of this very year, 2020, the Board of Trustees removed his name uh, from the School of Public and International Affairs in the wake of the killings of Breonna Taylor, Ahmed Arbery, George Floyd, and Maria Sharad Brooks um, that have so characterized the racial injustice, particularly against Blacks, in 1920. But this is a longer story, and if you haven't read, you should, uh, the extraordinary book by Isabel Wilkerson called Cast, which delineates the fact that this has been part of systemic racism, particularly against Blacks, that dates back 400 years to the very beginning uh, of this country. In addition to racism, uh, this was a period not of anti-science, but really pseudoscience. In fact, the pseudoscience was eugenics, uh, which became very dominant um, in the 20th century, which was coupled with bigotry, fostered um, policies on immigration, and uh, really has some connections to um, our current time. In fact, some of the policies being generated by Stephen Miller and Jeff Sessions in the White House that have impacted children and families and literally separated them have similes back um, to that very period. In fact, there's a connection to Stanford uh, because the very first president of Stanford, William Starr Jordan, was also an isolationist. And like Wilson, he was a eugenicist. And policies uh, that he fostered were leading to forced sterilizations to the point where in October of this very year, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, that Stanford decided to remove his name um, from the buildings that have occupied it for the last um, century. It's also really important to think about what was happening in immigration because that's so influencing the COVID uh, results today. And uh, there's an extraordinary book by Daniel Orkins called The Guarded Gate that was published in uh, 2019 that describes how bigotry and eugenics kept two generations of Jews and Italians and other European Americans out of America as we're now witnessing with immigrants from Mexico, Latin America, Muslim nations and others. 
So back to Wilson, um, he was an isolationism, uh, isolationist and he promised to keep the US out of World War I, which he did until 1917, uh, three years into the war. And that occurred with the prior sinking of the Lusitania and then a number of sinking of merchant vessels um, in 1917, coupled with the famous Zimmerman telegram, which was inviting Mexico to join Germany in the war against the US. And that prompted the decision to enter the war in 1917. And rapidly, there were more than a million soldiers in Europe as the epidemic broke out. And in fact, one out of 15 um, died of influenza. But the focus was on the war, uh, just as uh, in the current administration, the focus is on the economy. Uh, and it wasn't on the pandemic. Uh, in some similar ways, um, the president um, uh, really um, tried to deny or just not even acknowledge that the infection uh, was something that was serious and should be dealt with. Uh, this was something that had a propaganda machine associated with it, which concluded mechanisms for stifling free speech. Sounds familiar. And Wilson was promoting the Espionage Act that allowed the suppression of the press. In fact, newspapers did not even acknowledge um, the severity of the disease for the most part. And even in academia, uh, there were allies um, and enablers. So Nicholas Butler, who then was the president of Columbia University of New York and a national leader of the Republican Party, actually made efforts to fire faculty who were critical of cities like Philadelphia um, that had hosted parades and activities that increased the risk of infection, maybe the most famous of which was a Liberty Parade, uh, which occurred on September 28th and is reputed to have been two miles long and contributed to hundreds of thousands of people uh, getting the uh, infection. And in a chilling way, um, the Sedition Act that was passed in 1918 made it punishable for up to 20 years in jail um, to publish something that was disloyal or had abusive language about the government. Again, something that we're beginning to experience in this current um, pandemic. And not surprisingly, the elite blame the poor um, for the spread of the infection. So it's also important to note, um, because it has relevance to today, um, that the infection, the pandemic of 1918, occurred in really three waves beginning in 1918. Um, and the worst period was actually in the second uh, and third waves. Uh, in fact, there were more deaths from flu uh, in London from, than from flights of the German Zeppelin. And when the flu was ending, the ANSAC soldiers returning to New Zealand uh, brought with them lots of infection, including into Australia. And it's interesting how New Zealand uh, is dealing with this uh, infection today in contrast to that. In April of 2019, while he was attending the peace conference, President Wilson actually became ill uh, with the flu. Uh, he recovered from that, but then went on to have a stroke, which was actually hidden um, from the public. So what was the state of science at this time in 1918? Well, first of all, unlike today, the US was not a global leader in science. And just to put things in perspective, um, the Flexner Report of 19, was really in 1910 that led to the establishment of academic medical centers as we know them today. Stanford was founded in 1908, but was actually housed um, in uh, San Francisco until it moved to this campus in uh, 1959. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, um, our understanding of microbiology was relatively rudimentary. It was a young field. Koch had discovered the tubercle bacillus in 1888. Um, and the first viruses discovered were the tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus in 1892 and the yellow fever virus in 1901, but they weren't defined structurally. They were really um, defined as filterable agents that can contribute to infection. In fact, um, the cause of the 19 epidemic was not even established uh, until uh, 1933 by Shope. Uh, when he discovered another filterable product. Because during the epidemic, it was actually thought, thought that the cause of the influenza was bacterial, uh, that it was due to something called the Pfeiffer uh, bacillus, which now we know was Haemophilus influenza, uh, which was a very serious cause of infection. In fact, uh, an interesting connection for me was that when I started my own internship in Boston decades ago, the second patient that I admitted on my first day of inter internship was a child with H. flu meningitis who had serious consequences. 
And at that same time, in that same institution, um, David Smith was working on the vaccine that ultimately led to the elimination significantly of uh, H flu from our current uh, infectious disease um, uh, repertoire. In 1918, uh, the tools to treat infection were very limited. The armamentarium of uh, so-called magic bullets in the Paul Ehrlich form was really just arsenic, um, a compound that was really uh, uh, led to salvarsin, which was used to treat syphilis. In fact, antibiotics, as we know them today, did not appear until the 1930s and 40s, and antivirals didn't appear until the 1950s. A cyclovir was actually discovered in 1974 and really didn't enter uh, the clinic until 1982. There's some other interesting parallels um, to today. In 1890, uh, Emil Bering and uh, Kitsato um, developed the first toxoid against tetanus and immunotherapy, interestingly, using convalescent sera was actually part of the therapeutic regime in the 1918 pandemic. So I mentioned um, already that uh, the discovery of the cause of, in, of the influenza pandemic uh, occurred by Shope in 1933. Um, and uh, that uh, knowledge um, has really uh, become full circle. In the 1990s and 2000s, um, Taunenberger found that the 1918 was in fact an avian H1N1 strain um, that had relatively small changes in the genes of hemagglutin that allowed it to adapt um, to humans and to contribute um, to its virulence. And there were other changes in the neuraminidase glycol proteins that led to mutations on the polymerase that impacted the virulence of this infection. And then going even further and using um, the tools of molecular biology, um, scientists, including Tannenberger, were actually able um, to develop in the lab um, a variant of the influenza uh, virus. The 1918 wasn't the first time um, that this strain had probably been seen. There are actually epidemiological tracks that take it back to 1510, um, coming out of Africa and 1580 in Asia. And as you all know, there have been subsequent pandemics uh, as well. A few comments on the disease itself. Um, in 1918, sort of like today, 98% um, of people had typical influenza, severe, but without major complications. But the other 2% progressed in highly um, significant and devastating um, ways. Um, different from today, the major population uh, that was infected uh, were the 20 to 40 year olds. Um, and the symptoms that were seen uh, were pretty terrifying. Uh, they uh, really um, uh, were constitutional. Um, the first phase was fever, headaches, aching, malaise, nausea, vomiting. Um, and the second phase would lead to um, severe respiratory um, symptoms, some of whom died um, literally quickly. And uh, almost while standing up, uh, the disease could progress so quickly. This is a self-portrait by Evard Munch. Um, and uh, the left side uh, shows him during um, the midst of his own infection. You can see he looks pale, his mouth is open as he's breathing or trying to breathe carefully. And on the right side, as he's recovering, ruddy uh, probably from all the coughing um, that he had done. Um, the uh, virus killed people for two reasons. One, because of the direct damage um, that it did to the lung tissue itself. But the second, and somewhat different from today, and importantly, with the bacterial secondary infections, particularly with strep uh, and staph, for which, by the way, there were no therapies. And then similar to today, uh, there um, uh, were consequences beyond um, the lungs. Pericarditis and kidney disease was notable. And um, uh, this is uh, important in terms, again, of the global morbidity and mortality. To remind you, 50 million people died 675,000 deaths uh, in the United States. Um, so this was a, a major, major event. Um, 30 to 70,000 uh, people die annually from influenza, just by way of comparison. And I'll make some uh, further comparisons of that momentarily uh, when, when I come to COVID. Uh, at the end of um, the infection, you've seen this picture, I'm sure, but maybe didn't realize um, that this was actually uh, attributable to um, uh, Munch's view of what it was like um, to experience um, influenza in him and in others, titled The Scream, which really speaks to the severity that people perceive this infection. 
Are there some parallels with regard to uh, approaches to treatment? Um, believe it or not, people were recommending hydrogen peroxide rinses, um, quinine, camphor balls, uh, a little bit uh, familiar to some of the recommendations that we've heard about disinfectant ri uh, rinses as well. Uh, and there were public health uh, approaches that were notable uh, as well. Uh, this is a little reminiscent of what we're seeing today, but closing of schools and uh, theaters, um, public gatherings being prohibited, um, and um, uh, the wearing of masks. And in fact, uh, there is a lot of data uh, demonstrated, including reports during flu and also in 1924 in JAMA, demonstrating that um, these approaches could mitigate uh, the uh, effects of the infection and also mitigate the economic consequences uh, that were occurring. Um, those cities that utilized um, the approach uh, of social distancing and mask wearing did significantly better um, than those did not. And uh, activities went on. Um, we just had the World Series, and you can see this was baseball uh, in 1918. Uh, and uh, it really uh, uh, meant that people were striving and trying to find ways to normalize um, their, their lives. Um, San Francisco, like today, um, did better uh, because it followed uh, many of the policies. Philadelphia, as I've already alluded to, did not. Um, and this uh, is, again, uh, a message for uh, the present and the future. And uh, this was uh, a 1918 a message. And it's interesting that uh, we're now uh, hearing about the potential national policy on wearing masks. Uh, this was a 1918 variance on that, wear a mask or go to jail. Uh, as I mentioned already, um, the um, 1918 was a prelude. It's kind of called the mother of all flus or the father of all flus. Um, and uh, uh, it spawned a number of other influenza pandemics to the point where most of our thinking about pandemics has to a large extent been around how to prevent future epidemics uh, and pandemics related to influenza. In fact, uh, in 2004, HHS developed a whole policy around prevention of flu, which was re, uh, redated in 2015 and could have made a major difference for us, but it was largely ignored, uh, unfortunately. There are some threads um, that I think are important to um, note um, and uh, uh, with regard to the infection itself that connect to our science. I mentioned uh, Shope's discovery in 1933, another uh, well-known scientist who was working uh, on influenza and was thinking about it as a bacterial disease was Oswald Avery, who later uh, at the Rockefeller teamed up with Colin McLeod and Macklin McCarty uh, to try and understand the virulence of encapsulated and uncapsulated strep um, and ultimately attributed that to nucleic acids, which subsequently they reported in 1944, uh, defining DNA as the material found in genes. So from uh, the starting of um, 2018 to 1944, considerable progress made, obviously picked up just a handful of years later by Watson, Crick, Wilkins, and importantly, Rosalind Franklin, that led to the definition of the double helix of DNA. And as you know, lots followed um, after that. Relevant to our communication today in 1970, the independent uh, discovery by Howard Temin uh, at Wisconsin and David Baltimore at MIT uh, that in RNA tumor viruses, there were rever reverse transcriptase um, had relevance to the next part of our saga. And uh, for the third part, the work of Dale Kaiser early on from Stanford and Wally Gilbert and Sanger and others paved the way um, for the genetic sequencing that leapt over uh, into the next virus and connected us to SARS with rapid definition of that, that infection. So I'm gonna move um, from 1918 um, to what took place uh, in 1981. Um, this was a extraordinary time. Um, as Bonnie alluded to, I was at the NIH at that time. Uh, we were emerging, uh, again, some very interesting uh, uh, analogies. We were emerging from a scandal in the White House. Watergate had occurred under the Nixon administration. And in 1980, the transition from President Carter to President uh, Reagan took uh, place. Um, and it was a big shift uh, in the US mindset. 
1981, um, Sandra Day O'Connor uh, was appointed the first female um, justice. Um, so again, a commonality to where we are today. Um, and on the medical side, it was the time when uh, first fetal surgery uh, was done in 1981 at UCSF. And here at Stanford, the first heart lung uh, transplant uh, was performed. Uh, it was a time of rising respect uh, for science, different from today. Uh, and the war on cancer uh, was about a decade uh, old uh, at that time. Um, and then on June 5th, 1981, five cases of pneumocystis pneumonia in gay men in Los Angeles was reported by the CDC and followed rather rapidly um, by the finding of Kaposi sarcoma in, in New York uh, in IV um, drug users. And interestingly, I actually was contacted at that time uh, to uh, add any insights that were possible as to why people who didn't have cancer or other immunosuppression might be acquiring these opportunistic infections. And it was really quite unclear about what was going on at that time. But the fact that this was occurring, HIV early on in gay men, was associated, sadly, with an enormous amount of bias and homophobia. Uh, with this new disease, with lots of discriminatory characterizations and considerable uncertainty about what cause was and what might be done about it. But science ultimately moved forward. And in 1983, um, investigators uh, at the Pasteur Institute uh, discovered the lymphadenopathy-associated virus. This was coupled with the discovery of GALO, um, of the HTLV uh, virus um, at the, from the NCI. And uh, this occurred really 13 years faster um, from the time of first case to the characterization of the virus from what had happened in influenza. Related to um, uh, the role of science, it's important to know that in 1983, Kerry Mullis, who is a scientist at CETUS, invented PCR, something that we take for granted today. Um, and the claim is that he actually did this while driving um, from San Francisco to Mendocino on Highway 128 when he made the intellectual leap that by using two opposed primers, one complementary to the upper strand and the other to the lower strand could be amplified by multiple cycles of denaturation, annealing and polymerization. And uh, for those who remember the early days of HIV, PCR uh, became a significant tool uh, that uh, really did make a difference. Unlike 1918, drug discovery happened much more quickly um, in the HIV era. And as I already alluded to, uh, this is par uh, partly attributable to the fact that uh, the reverse transcriptase had been identified by Baltimore and Temin. And that led um, to the use of dideoxynucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, and then to the literal crystallization of the other viral enzymes, the protease uh, and the integrase, um, that led to uh, approaches to therapy. There were deniers uh, at the time. Uh, some may remember Peter Duisberg um, at UCSF, a well-known scientist who, among others, said that the science was wrong, um, that this was not the cause of HIV, and that promoted a tremendous amount of conflict within the scientific community. Another interesting connection back to 1920 is that HIV actually tracks back um, likely to 1920 in Kinshasa, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, where the first sporadic cases were um, discovered uh, and not fully appreciated until uh, the 1970s and then the early 80s, when more than 100,000 uh, cases in five continents had spread quickly and silently uh, as well. Uh, it was also um, uh, followed by the first cases of vertical transmission in 1983. And one of the index cases was a woman named Elizabeth Glazer who received a blood transfusion uh, for placenta previa at Cedar sinai before the blood supply was clean and gave birth to a daughter and then a son uh, who had HIV. And uh, there is a important connection that I'll allude to in a moment uh, with regard to um, how we proceeded in terms of trying to deal with this, this infection. So as Bonnie mentioned, I was at the NIH during uh, uh, the early 1980s. I was in charge of the pediatric and adult ID services. And so I began seeing some of the early cases occurring in gay men, 
uh, but by uh, 1980, the early 1980s, 83, it became apparent that this was a disease that was affecting children. And we made the decision uh, that it was time to really try to take this on uh, in our own uh, programs and laboratories. At that time, the first antiretroviral agents was uh, being uh, pursued by Sam Broder, uh, then director of the NCI and a colleague of mine whose lab was next to my own. Uh, and the decision was made, and when I did so, it was not very popular among my colleagues that we would begin uh, developing protocols and treatment paths for children uh, with HIV. It wasn't an easy road, and there are some very similar patterns that we're experiencing today. Um, drug companies were not interested uh, in treating children, and the FDA was not interested in seeing clinical trials done uh, for children. So we had to fight very hard um, to uh, uh, get permission um, to uh, proceed with clinical trials. And we decided with the very first um, to use a different approach. We decided to use an intravenous um, continuous infusion strategy because we reasoned that that would potentially have a significant impact on the pharmacokinetics and particularly uh, that it would provide better coverage of the blood-brain barrier, knowing already at that time that neurodegeneration was a significant feature um, for what was occurring uh, in uh, HIV disease in children. Um, and this was a, um, uh, one of the times when the science actually made a difference. And while there were many who felt negatively about what we were doing, the results began to speak uh, a very different uh, story. So let me come back. And I'm going to show you just a short video. Um, this is a child that we treated early on uh, with um, uh, continuous infusion a AZT. And I'm going to show you two time points. What we did during this time as we were studying uh, the use of these drugs is we measured everything um, from the pharmacokinetics to the viral effects both in blood and the CNS um, to neurotransmitters, neurocognitive um, studies, uh, as well as um, uh, videotaping and recording everything that we were doing uh, as well. Um, so this is a little bit anecdotal, but I think it will show you why we were so concerned about what we were seeing. So now this is what happened after um, seven months of continuous infusion. So um, that was a uh, pretty dramatic uh, event and um, it really led us to think that we were making a difference. We had a route or a pathway um, to proceed. So this was a time when there was a lot of disbelief um, and a lot of emotion surrounding the infection. These results were taking place around 1987. And it was at a time uh, when um, the president of the United States was denying, in some ways, the relevance of this disease. Um, so in 1987, um, it was finally decided that there would be the announcement of the AIDS Commission. And um, President Reagan uh, came to the NIH. That's where the commission was going to be announced. Uh, but because there was concern about him uh, shaking the hand of a gay man, it was decided uh, that it was much safer um, to have a pediatric patient infected. So uh, for that reason, we were asked um, to be engaged in the process and to uh, uh, provide information for the president. And so I had the unique opportunity to spend an hour 
uh, with the president going from bedside to bedside, using every mechanism at my disposal to try and share with him the importance of the uh, what we were dealing with. And then came the uh, goal, the whole reason for the visit, which was for him uh, to hold uh, the child, um, as you see on the right. And here's the AP announcement, as you can see, that basically said uh, this was a very spontaneous kind of thing um, that the president did. But the backstory of this was the following. This uh, child was sitting in his uh, little carriage um, in our playroom, and the president and I came into the room. And I said, Mr. President, would you like to hold uh, Mikey? Um, and he looked at me, and nothing happened. And I said, would you like to have your picture taken and nothing happened. And I then picked up Mikey and said, Mr. President, would you like to hold him? And nothing happened. And finally, out of desperation, knowing that I had a job to do, I literally thrust Mikey into his arms. Um, the picture was actually uh, probably moving backwards, but was right-sided and um, uh, it happened. And it was actually a really important thing uh, because it began to humanize um, this infection in an important way. That was further um, uh, aggravated a bit by what took place um, just a little bit later uh, in 1988, just a, a year later, we actually were announcing the results of that first clinical trial that I mentioned. We did this at the Stockholm AIDS conference um, uh, with pretty significant results and a lot of interest um, around the country on it. And yet, uh, the drug wasn't approved. We had children dying on the wait list and we felt very worried and frustrated by what was happening. And I learned another lesson at that time. I had a call from Susan Oki, who's a physician from the Washington Post, um, who asked um, uh, why this wasn't happening. And I said things like, uh, well, the FDA must be full of lunatics. Um, and uh, front page coverage of the Washington Post um, uh, with some unfortunate quotes experiencing the emotion and frustration behind what we were experiencing. But it did have an impact uh, because within three weeks, um, the FDA did uh, prove an expedited review for uh, AZT for children. And that allowed the drug not only to be used nationally, but to also be employed in some of the fundamental studies um, that led to the trials that led to the prevention of vertical transmission in children. I think it's important as we think about these infections to never lose sight of the human uh, connection, particularly to children. And I'm always reminded of the writings and poems, um, drawings of children. And this one I think is very poignant. Oftentimes people say that children don't have um, the ability for uh, really um, thinking uh, uh, from the point of view of conscious, uh, consciousness. And here's a quote from a nine-year-old BJ who says, uh, as he's drawn this um, picture of a tree, um, he says, I'm an acorn. I'm scared of squirrels. I'm not scared of dying because I'll grow back again. Pretty profound statement, highly relevant to, uh, to what we're doing. So the years of HIV was pretty dramatic, um, but it did demonstrate that there could be an important fusion once leadership was engaged of the ID community, national leadership, public health community, biotech, academic centers, regulatory agencies, and of course the gay com community that made such a tremendous difference. Um, and that bonding um, just continued. Um, this was uh, moving to another president, visiting the NIH, uh, President Bush. And I show you this picture um, just to let you know that Tony Fauci then, he's uh, the third person in the white coat, Sam Broder is second. Uh, there's Tony, we're all 40 years younger. Um, but Tony was an iconic figure then, a leader, um, and is, uh, of course, today, and to my mind, has been really a national hero uh, in dealing with, uh, with this story. The other national heroes are really some of the uh, parents who stood uh, so firmly on behalf of children. And to me, the most important of these was Elizabeth Glazer, who teamed up with two of her friends, Susie Zegan and Susan D. Laurentis, to form the Pediatric AIDS Foundation. And though Elizabeth died of HIV, as did her daughter, Ariel, her son, Jake, uh, because he began on the therapies that we had initiated at the NIH, uh, is still alive today. And I think that is an important um, tribute to the role of science and, and medicine. So I now want to move on. Um, to the current days and um, uh, just remind us that here we are in uh, 2020. 
and it's a period of time that has some similarities to what we've witnessed in uh, past years. This has been a period of rising uh, polarization over the last decades, particularly over the last several years, a time of populism and authoritarianism, not just in the United States, but really worldwide. Uh, it's been a time where the agenda of our federal government uh, has been about isolationism, fracturing uh, old allies and creating in many ways anger and hostility. Uh, it's been a uh, period of uh, real abuse and uh, the, and the ra rapid rise again of an old story that's been with us for 400 years of systemic racism and indeed anti-Semitism. I think it's important that COVID should give us a pause on where we are and really empower us to think about what we're doing in the future, uh, because there are other connections that are being dismissed as well, uh, particularly climate change and its impact on health. And uh, I think all of us realize uh, that even when this pandemic is over, if we don't address these issues, uh, we will face even worse consequences um, going forward. And this is a, sadly coupled with the real anti-science view that's been seen today. And that has relevance to the moment. As of um, just yesterday, there have been over 40, uh, nearly 45 million people infected globally uh, with SARS-CoV-2 and uh, over 9 million in the United States with over 1.2 million deaths uh, worldwide and now over 228,000 deaths in the US. And if we just remember back uh, to 1918, uh, where there were 675 deaths after the end of the epidemic, and now we recognize that we're in the second wave uh, of the epidemic. Uh, this bodes um, rather concerningly for what uh, might happen. Um, and it is um, notable that on October 1st, 1st, the president became infected, which just shows us um, that there is hardly any place that's impermeable um, to the sin infection. Um, so these are important consequences for us to remember. Now, I think remarkably, um, in 1918, it took 15 years to get to the diagnosis um, of the infection or the delineation of the infection, three years for HIV. Within a month of the first cases of um, SARS-CoV-2, there had been a complete sequencing shared publicly uh, of the virus, which has allowed um, the development of druggable targets to be delineated. And importantly, as we are now uh, moving forward, hopefully um, vaccines um, to be uh, in our horizon as a way of dealing uh, with the infection going forward. Children, um, unlike 1918, have not been uh, as severely infected, particularly those in the first decade uh, of life, um, where there has been uh, less morbidity and less mortality. Although there has been, uh, as I've noted already, significant uh, differences in uh, children as in adults um, with uh, new with, with infection uh, severity uh, in racial and ethnic minorities. The impact on the disadvantaged has been notable and Lisa Chamberlain and her colleagues and my own wife Peggy have really demonstrated this in very important uh, ways. The impact on the pandemic um, is something that uh, we could have done more about. Uh, it is a tragedy to witness what has happened uh, in this country. Other countries have done far better. Um, Jason Wang has demonstrated for us how Taiwan, a country just 80 miles um, from Wuhan, the epicenter of this infection, was able to contain the virus by the combination of government leadership and technology that allowed to early testing, um, quarantining, social distancing, the use of PPEs that made such a difference. And while China had a major um, outbreak, of course, at the beginning, it did exercise a lot of force and uh, engagement to really contain the virus as it's doing today. Uh, and while we sometimes think of it as being social technology, it turns out uh, a recent book called The Wuhan Diary by Fang Fang uh, that was just reviewed in the New York Review of Books um, describes many um, individuals on the ground who are actually advocating for social distancing and mask wearing beyond uh, what's taking place um, uh, by just technology itself. And then New Zealand uh, has been a wonderful example of how we can make progress um, 
And uh, as you know, New Zealand, um, of course, it's a country, um, uh, that, uh, a nation that is on an island, uh, but they have done an incredible job uh, by border control measures, community transmission control, uh, by using the kind of technologies that really um, could make a, uh, make a major difference. So here we are, knowing that there are things that we can do, uh, and we're debating uh, things uh, about whether we should do them. Uh, in this very nation, which until uh, this infection had the best public health agency in the world. And it is a tragedy to see what has happened um, to the CDC uh, during the course of this infection, uh, the discrediting that has gone on and the leadership vacuum uh, that has contributed to that. And it's also tragic to see what's happened to the FDA, uh, a extra extraordinary regulatory agency that we witnessed um, uh, had the power of really looking at science and data and to see that they quickly approved hydroxychloroquine and hyperimmune plasma with minimal data uh, really speaks um, um, to a disregard for the truth uh, in science. And then to um, see um, the president of the United States referring to Tony Fad Fauci as a tragedy, um, as someone who uh, was a disaster, uh, really speaks against um, uh, the role of leadership in really defining the approach to, to economics. And we've witnessed that close to home um, with a former Stanford faculty member, Scott Atlas, who became a coronavirus um, uh, advisor to the president who has been speaking literally mistruths that led uh, 105 of us to construct an open letter. And I and nearly all of the pediatric ID division, along with Bonnie and members of our microbiology team, epidemiology and health um, group, um, stood up um, against that, even though within days uh, after sending our letter, we were threatened uh, by a lawsuit from President, Reg president Trump's uh, personal lawyer. Um, thankfully, we were able um, to have our own uh, attorneys, um, and they have allowed us to stand up and not be intimidated, which I think is so important uh, at these very times. This has led to a debate, um, which is going on, as many of you um, know, uh, that are taking place, taking place regarding to this concept of herd immunity. Um, and I think that here we need to be mindful of what the agenda is. Um, the agenda about herd community is not really about really the health of the nation. It's about the economic health of the nation. Of course, if we open things up and allow things to be, get back to normal, that would be great for the economy, particularly for those um, who uh, were able to benefit from it. But there is a important consequence of doing that because it affects disproportionately those who are, uh, who are in socially economically deprived areas. So a recent study that is coming out in Nature by Chang uh, has looked at this in um, over 100 million people studying mobility um, uh, over a two month period. And they demonstrate in this study that venues like restaurants, gyms, religious settings predict infection, um, as we know from epidemiological data. But they also demonstrated that individuals coming um, from neighborhoods that have higher numbers of frontline workers and less, uh, uh, ha have, uh, and less reductions in activity have more risk um, for developing infection. So uh, when we uh, proffer um, that approaches like the Great Barrington Declaration would actually make a difference, uh, what we're doing is potentially promoting A, an opportunity uh, where the infection will spread to all communities, but particularly to disadvantaged communities. And I'm glad to say that uh, uh, herd immunity is something that uh, we should look at critically and carefully. Uh, it has a lot of bias associated with it. And as you can see from this uh, cartoon, um, a lot of the advocates um, have strong views that are really not um, science-based. I'm also glad to see that Great Barrington uh, that was the home of the Great Barrington Declaration, in fact, um, said uh, that they don't approve of the name of their own town being associated with this. And there are other scientific reasons for being concerned. Um, Shai Pillar, uh, Pillai has um, demonstrated that the germinal centers in our in, in lymph nodes um, may not demonstrate with, with COVID um, that antibody will be protective for long periods of time. So I'm going to end by just saying this is a time for restoration, a time for truth, a time for science, a time for protection of our trusted agency, for better alignment of leaders in public health, time for protection and advocacy for children, 
Uh, in many ways, um, there are lessons to be learned that are a century old, um, but it's still the end of the beginning. Uh, but there is hope um, that we can go forward in a positive way by better alignment of truth and science for the public health. So thank you very much again for allowing me to be with you today. Well, thank you, Phil. Um, I think we're right at the hour. So um, I uh, don't think we will have time uh, at this point for questions. Sure. Uh, I'm happy to receive questions. If people want to write to me directly, uh, they can do so. Yeah, that would be great. I was just going to suggest that perhaps um, you could. And I think that's just been a really wonderful um, book-ended series. I know that uh, some of us have lived not all the way back to 1918. I don't think any of us have, but um, certainly we were prepared by the lessons from 1918 for the pandemic in 2009, the pandemic flu in 2009. And uh, Phil, I was one of the people who really followed your HIV work early on when I was a brand new assistant professor here and we enrolled our first patient in your uh, IV trial. So. Um, uh, I want to thank you again for your wisdom and advice and your counsel uh, that you have provided over this particular pandemic, but more importantly, over the entire your entire career, and then more specifically, while you have been our leader here at Stanford, and you continue to be uh, one of our leaders here at Stanford. So um, I want to thank everybody for your thank attention. You, Please direct your questions. I think. Um, if you want to direct them to the department or to Phil, I don't want his inbox to get overflowing, but um, but we will continue to hear from you and see what uh, what next steps will be with this particular pandemic as well. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, Phil, and to everybody else. Um, have a great weekend and please stay safe and healthy. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University please visit us at med.stanford.edu.